place of exhilarating beauty, where skyscraping peaks meet gem-colored lakes. In the next hour, we'll head up with high-altitude thrill-seekers, meet up with a celebrated search and rescue team, hang our Stetsons at a working dude ranch, and explore a Yellowstone connection, where summer's lush and winter is magical. We'll travel high and low for an insider's view of one of America's premier national parks. Hailed as a geological wonder, the Teton mountain range soars to heights of over 13,000 feet. At its base, the Snake River twists and turns through northwestern Wyoming. To trappers in the 19th century, the Deep Valley was a hole called Jackson Hole, after mountain man Davy Jackson. Today, the jumping off point to explore the park is the town that bears his name, located on the border. Where the Wild West meets upscale shopping and a host of outdoor outfitters. In this part of the world, the horizontal and vertical terrain make it easy to answer the call of the wild. Grand Teton is a hiker's paradise. Over 250 miles of marked trails lead through backcountry where the sights are extraordinary. You get out here and, and the first thing you feel like is you're in a movie. I mean, you see so many Westerns and these high dollar movies now with these scenic backdrops that just take your breath away. And you get in there and it's just like heaven. In this slice of heaven, descending glaciers sculpted the jewel colored lakes at the base of the Teton Range. We have six really large lakes and literally dozens and dozens of smaller alpine lakes that make great destinations if you're hiking in the backcountry. And it gives you great experiences of getting out on the water and you can be looking at these mountains, you can be breathing this great air. Also called a paddler's park, canoes have been a mode of transportation on these cold, clear waters since the days of the early explorers. Designed to be lightweight, canoers can portage or carry the boat from one lake to the next, where the serenity can speak to the soul. Home to over 360 species of wildlife, Grand Teton is one of the best national parks to see animals. In the spring, the sagebrush of the Jackson Hole Valley is a food source for the pronghorn. It's here the fastest land mammal in North America can be seen on the move. While they stand out at this time of the year, when the grass dries out, their bicolor acts as a camouflage. Unlike pronghorn, bison don't blend in. They gather in groups along the grassy meadows. In the denser wetlands, a bull moose feeds on willows. More solitary by nature, moose appear docile, but beware, especially in the spring. Sometimes people make the mistake that they're a little more tolerant of people than they really are, and this time of the year, the moose are having their calves, and we consider them one of the most dangerous animals in the park. 
At the Oxbow Bend turnout, wildlife watchers wait for a glimpse of activity along the shoreline. On a calm, clear day, they're rewarded with a striking reflection. To protect the majestic landscape, Grand Teton was set aside as a national park in 1929. One of its most popular trails leads by the cascading tiers of Hidden Falls. A path winds up to Inspiration Point. More than a vista, it looks out on an area that was destined for development until Yellowstone Superintendent Horace Albright brought philanthropist John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his wife Abby out to see it in 1926. They drove down the Teton Park Road and saw a burned out gas station, an old dance hall, billboards, a racetrack, a power line right along on the west side of the road in front of the mountains, and they asked what they could do to change this. Albright then shared his secret Jackson Hole plan. He wanted to buy up some of these offending properties and perhaps either make a national park or enlarge a national park through the purchase of these properties, but he didn't have the clout or the money to do that. Under the name the Snake River Land Company, Rockefeller quietly acquired 35,000 acres for national park lands. When the land venture was revealed, it outraged the locals. Why? Number one, that was land that these ranchers grazed their cattle on. Number two, if all of that land were given to the federal government, it would come out of the tax rolls of Teton County. What would this do to the county's ability as a government to stay afloat? The controversy caused Congress to at first refuse the gift. Rockefeller held the land for 15 years until 1950 when Grand Teton National Park, as we know it, was born. John D. Rockefeller Jr. maintained a presence in the park. He purchased the J.Y. Ranch on the shores of Phelps Lake. The ranch itself, thanks to Father's purchase, became a, a very important uh, uh, place in, in our family. For seven decades, the ranch was a Rockefeller retreat. His son Lawrence inherited it. Over time, he developed a vision for its future. My brother really devoted a good part of his life to land conservation. And therefore, it seemed clear that it should ultimately belong to the government, to the people. Lawrence Rockefeller gave the 1,100-acre J.Y. Ranch to Grand Teton National Park in 2001, but not as a monument to his family. He ordered all buildings and trails removed, and the land he cherished returned to the wilderness. Skirting along the edge of Grand Teton National Park, one of the best ways to behold the beauty of this region is riding high in the sky. It takes a team effort to prep for a launch. A burner heats things up. As hot air meets the cooler outside air, the balloon rises. Beyond the trees, the wind takes over. The topography of this area makes it ideal for ballooning. The mountain valleys create wonderful circulatory winds. I've counted 14 different wind layers in this layer cake. And it allows us to go just about anywhere we want. In this form of flying, you can hear the rush of a river and get an overview. Well, that's an elk here with some bushes in front of it. Traveling is a breeze. 
Okay, folks, we're going to land with a little momentum. All too soon, it's time to come down to Earth. <laughs> Topping off the day with a champagne toast is fitting for a place that balances the wilderness with a touch of civilization. Cheers. Cheers. Grand Teton National Park provides a breathtaking backdrop for all sorts of outdoor enthusiasts. The single most popular summer activity? Getting wet and wild. From its northern origin in Yellowstone National Park, the Snake River winds its way through the Jackson Hole Valley. Yet it's not the serpent shape that gives the river its name. It comes from the Shoshone Indians who once summered along its banks. A scenic float through the heart of the park offers a rare opportunity to pass through a rich habitat. Along its banks, a bald eagle fishes and a moose moves to the water's edge. It's always the highlight of the trip, no matter what else takes place, if we get to see um, wildlife, it's the, the best thing. Once called Mad River, south of the park boundary, the snake hits a canyon where it changes from a swift current to powerful white water. With a seasoned guide at the helm, paddlers work their way through it. The bigger the hydraulics, the better. Lunch Cow, the most intense of the rapids, is also a hangout to see the scene. Guided trips rarely have a problem. But for those going it on their own, it's a different story. Kayakers face off against a liquid obstacle course and surfs up. Once a year, when conditions are just right, spring runoff raises the water level enough to catch a big wave. The Snake River is one among many water wonders. With over 70 miles of shoreline, Jackson Lake, the largest in the park, has a sapphire surface that mirrors the full Teton Range. Set back from the shore sits a namesake lodge. Jackson Lake Lodge was declared a National Historic Landmark, and it was built and opened in 1955 by Lawrence Rockefeller, the son of John D. Rockefeller. It has a very, very grand lobby, so that when you come into Jackson Lake Lodge, you walk forward into a lobby with uh, ceiling-high picture windows. So most visitors have that aha moment when they first enter that room and they see the mountain range right before their eyes. Off the lobby, the main dining area, called the mural room, features themes from the frontier. Visitors can also savor the scenery along with an icon of the park. Beneath the lofty peaks of Grand Teton, Mount Owen, and Tiwanot, Jenny Lake graces the landscape. It's home to one of the National Park's most luxurious lodges. Jenny Lake Lodge first opened as a guest ranch in the 1920s. Today's guests are treated to peace, quiet, and some culinary creations. The food philosophy, gourmet mountain fare with an innovative flair. We do a five course dinner and we try and do a lot of different games. One of our signature dishes is the espresso rubbed venison loin. It comes with a cognac gloss as well as a vanilla bean Yukon gold potato puree. 37 historic cabins are rustic on the outside. Inside, it's sophisticated comfort.
Amid the groves of pine, a special setting makes Jenny Lake Lodge a little gem. This haven for nature lovers hasn't lost sight of its wild western roots. Cattle ranchers first settled here in the 1890s. Their ranches once dotted the valley. This classic western way of life hasn't totally disappeared from the park. Daylight is barely breaking when the cowboys and cowgirls drive in a herd. Wranglers really have to hustle to get things ready to hit the trail. In the shadow of the Teton Range, Triangle X Ranch has the distinction of being the only working dude ranch in a national park. The Turner family began hosting city slickers in search of their inner cowboy in the 1920s. Over 80 years and three generations, very little has changed. The neat thing about it on a, on a dude ranch, it's a total level playing field. It makes no difference who you are, how much money you make, and so it breaks down all social barriers. Everybody pay attention. Big Red and Lulu. First, dudes get matched up with their horses. It's kind of a total outdoor recreation experience. I mean, you come to ride just as, you know, our forefathers rode. In case you're wondering, a dude is a 19th century term once given to visitors, mostly from the east, who weren't so comfortable on the open range. At a butte called Spencer's Mountain, ranch hands whip up a good old-fashioned skillet breakfast. After grub, a hot drink, and a quick nap. These modern-day dudes are back in the saddle, riding remote trails where there are no signs of civilization. Come on, keep going. Yeah. Yep. Come on. At the end of the day, the herd heads out to pasture. Guests can enjoy the warm glow of a western sunset. The towering peaks of Grand Teton National Park are considered one of the classic images of the American wilderness. The Shoshone Indians called them Tiwanak, meaning many pinnacles, an observation that wasn't lost on French trappers passing through in the 1800s. Their name for the three essential peaks was Les Trois Titans, the Three Breasts. So our understanding is that when they saw these mountains, they had a very vivid imagination, very colorful imagination, and to them it looked like women's anatomy. Today, they inspire a lust for adventure with seven principal summits over 12,000 feet. Called the Switzerland of America, many are drawn to these mountains. But the experience isn't reserved for world-class climbers. But you want to pay attention to little rough spots in the rock and put your foot The first the stop, Exum Mountain Guides, located inside the park. See if you can climb this entire section without using your hands at all. Named for its founder, Glenn Exum, who forged the classic climbing route to the top of Grand Teton, dubbed the Exum Ridge. To teach others technical skills, Exum and fellow climbing legend Paul Petzold led hundreds of ascents. Together, the two men pioneered the sport of mountaineering in America. So in this case, my left leg is the brake, so I'm gonna flake my rope on the right-hand side. Today, Exum guides follow in their footsteps, 
inspiring all ages to reach for new heights. A course begins with simple bouldering, just walking up a rock slope. It's a remarkable progression, and it just sort of brings out the fact that humans are actually pretty natural climbers, even though they don't know it. Once everyone masters safety equipment, and they learn the ropes, they're scaling a rock wall. The next step is to take on the peaks. But first, you have to gear up for it. Where one misstep can spell disaster, guides say it's more about awareness and stamina than gorilla arm strength. The series of pitches gets progressively harder. One challenging maneuver has a climber clinging to a cliff with a 500 foot drop. Where your right foot is. You gotta get out there and stand on that right foot a little bit more and then you can match your feet on it. To finesse the move requires matching hand and footholds while crossing the rock face. Stand on that little handhold, yeah. Left a little bit further with your feet. There you go. There you go. That's the hard part. You're done. You step out just over an abyss. It just drops down. So, and it's it's the hardest move of the climb too. So not only do you have the exposure, but the difficulty there too. And it's also just the, the very top of the whole spire. It's a lot of exposure, but it's a thrill, definitely. Nice, Charlie. For even more exposure, at 13,770 feet, the jagged pinnacle called the Grand is the star of the range. It's a very striking peak. It's a beautiful mountain, and you can't miss it as you drive into the valley from any direction. For anyone that has a little bit of a sense of adventure, you immediately wonder, what would it be like up there? You know, what would I see? Towering above its neighbors, a summit of the Grand is more like a calling. The majority of climbers come here to conquer it, a feat that takes fitness, two days of training, and total focus. We all talk about having to chunk things down in life. You know, you have a big goal and you're gonna have to figure out the small steps to get there. The series of obstacles to overcome are as much mental as physical. You become really absorbed in the moment and you're starting to really take things in very, very small bite-sized chunks. Pushing your own limits makes getting to the top all the more memorable. Once man takes on the mountain, Accidents happen. Yeah, it's a great bend. The double grapevine, a good one to practice. Bend. Led by veteran Rennie Jackson, the Jenny Lake Rangers have earned international recognition. This will be free. Take the tension off that load. We have quite a group of rangers that are specially skilled in mountain rescue, both from you know going up the trails on, on the ground as well as a very elite group that flies below a helicopter attached to a line. High altitude rescues are loaded with risk. The team puts their lives on the line, even when they train for an operation called a short haul. They are. The term short haul does not refer to the length of the line or anything. It refers to the helicopter moving the human load from the starting point to the nearest place that a helicopter can safely land. So it's a, it's a short distance. To secure a person in a device called a litter, 
fluid teamwork is crucial. Stop. Stop. Good knot tying skills, even more so. Multiple knots ensure there's a backup system. When you're hanging by a thread, time is of the essence. You may have someone who is really badly hurt up on a ledge, uh, high altitude in a, in a technical climbing situation, and you need to be able to get that person to definitive medical care as quickly as possible. Using the short haul method, 15 to 30 rescues each year that would otherwise take days can be accomplished in mere hours. With hazardous variables of weather and visibility, there's no margin for error. Everyone's lives are ultimately in the hands of a skilled helicopter pilot. In this playland for thrill seekers, Many have lived to tell about their ordeal thanks to the incredible skill of the Jenny Lake Rangers. A number of lives have been saved and that, that's the coolest thing, coolest feeling. From November to April, Snow covers the mountains and blankets the valley. As Grand Teton is seized in the icy grip of winter, the steaming Snake River winds its way through a tundra of snow and ice. With temperatures teetering below zero, those who brave the big chill see a different side of the park. In a winter setting, it is just spectacular. You have this incredible mountain range that is covered with snow, and you have a very quiet, solitary experience on the valley floor. And if you take the time to get out on the land, you can sort of feel like you're the only person in the world. Cross-country skiers slide across an open expanse and alpine enthusiasts huff and puff uphill, all in pursuit of making fresh tracks on virgin powder. You know a little bit about our snowshoe hike today, just some of the... Uh, Park rangers lead guided hikes in some pretty primitive footwear. And this is what's called an Alaskan style snowshoe. You can see it's pretty long, it's uh, a little bit narrower, it has a big turned up front, so it helps you to stay on top of the light, dry, powdery snow like we get here. Snowshoes let visitors get off the beaten track without sinking in. People aren't the only ones out and about. Animals have adapted to harsh conditions. Mule deer forage for food. Moose migrate from higher elevations to the valley, where their long legs help them navigate through deep drifts. On the southern boundary of the park, over 5,000 elk from Grand Teton, Yellowstone, and the surrounding lands make up the largest wintering elk herd in the world. The National Elk Refuge was created in 1912 after development began to threaten their winter range. Today, for a closer encounter, an open sleigh carries visitors through the refuge. Rarely do we see just elk when we're out on the sleigh rides. and um, It's very common to see coyotes, eagles. Mostly when you, when you watch the animals in the wintertime, they're in energy conservation mode. The males will, will spar. Now that's really common during the rut in the fall. Right now, they're just kind of practicing. Naturalists are on board to share information, but it's not all talk. 
we'll interpret for people what they see and give them some background on the elk, but we like to include in there just a lot of quiet time too, so that you can hear coyote howling and antlers clacking, and it can be a very peaceful and serene experience. While it's peaceful along the valley floor, in a land of contrasts, some have a need for speed. On the border of the park, Jackson Hole Mountain Resort is ski central. This world-class combination of steep terrain and abundant snowfall makes for a mass meeting of downhill junkies. It has 4,139 feet of vertical rise. That is the longest contiguous vertical rise in the country. But as important as the, the height is the steepness and the variety of terrain. We have all these amazing cliffs and huge bowls and gullies and long ridge lines. Most of all, the people who come here are uh, psyched to um, push their own limits. And so that really makes it unique in the Rockies for sure. It's not just about pushing your limits on groomed trails. The backcountry of Grand Teton National Park and the surrounding wilderness is only a lift away. Alpine guides lead the way to a drop off the backside of the mountain for a full out of bounds ski experience. I think a lot of people think of backcountry skiing as uh, you drop a rope and it's just one big bowl and you kind of do a little powder turning, you know. But in Jackson, it's pitch after pitch and there's rolls and there's steeps. And when you know this area as well as the guides do here, um, it's just a matter of taking a left turn where nobody else has taken that left turn. For those who want even more of a lift, high mountain heli skiing has the ticket. Outside the park, a helicopter lands precariously on a lone peak of the Snake River Range. Then, it's all downhill for over 2,000 vertical feet. To get deeper into the backcountry in winter requires a ski-in, ski-out place to stay. Rendezvous Backcountry Tours operates four yurts in the wilderness area, originally designed by Mongol nomads to endure long, brutal winters. The yurt's solid structure and angled roof make it the perfect shelter from the cold. It will shed snow off of the yurt and then the, the snow actually builds up on the walls and creates even extra insulation inside the hut. Yurts come fully equipped for surviving the night. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Get snow water here. And you can count on having plenty of snow to melt. It enables a group to come up here and spend a couple days in the mountains without having to carry in everything that they need. So it makes a nice resting place for weary skiers. But weary skiers never have to rough it in this part of the Rockies. Among the high-end hotels that dot the park's perimeter, the Amangani has it all. The name Amangani means peaceful home. It's very small, very intimate. We don't have many rules and regulations or policies and procedures. So that our guests really can feel like they're staying in, in one of their friends' homes. The Zen-inspired redwood design at this luxury year-round retreat makes it cozy. With only 40 rooms, the staff can cater to guests' every indulgence. 
We have breakfast, lunch, and dinner any time, any time of the day. You can get pancakes, filet mignon, or a prime New York steak. It's always open for whatever the guest wants. Customized cuisine, plus a window with quite a view, make the Amangani world class. With over 400 inches of annual snowfall, Grand Teton and its surroundings are a magnet in winter. Yet the same snow that draws people in can pack a punch. Massive avalanche slides thunder down mountainsides with deadly force. It's 5 a.m the base of Jackson Hole Mountain Resort. The mountain doesn't open to skiers for several hours, but Bob Comey and his team of avalanche forecasters are already hard at work. Their job? Making the resort avalanche safe and predicting the avalanche conditions for the backcountry. The general avalanche hazard is moderate above 9,000 feet today. By 7.30 a.m., the team is out of the lab and heading up the mountain. Good morning, workers. Currently, as far as what's going on, high pressure continues to dominate the weather pattern. First, they get a briefing on the weather conditions. Uh, backcountry forecast, we dropped it to low at mid and low elevation. At the top, ski patrollers take time to prep for the day. Then they head out to the slopes where they make a study of the stability of the snow. And I'm just brushing down, I'm looking for clues. Clues to the mystery. Well, that's a good layer. Softer, weaker layers are more likely to collapse and slide. Forecasters make every effort to keep people aware of avalanche hazards, but ultimately, there's only so much they can do. We come in, we give you information, but it's up to you to make good decisions. That's a lesson avalanche survivor Stephen Koch knows all too well. In April of 1998, Koch set out alone to snowboard Mount Owen one of the tallest peaks in Grand Teton National Park. But something went horribly wrong. I heard a noise above me, and I realized that it was an avalanche that had started in a cliff band above me. And next thing I knew, the snow shot over the lip and it hit me and knocked me back. And all of a sudden, just it turned totally violent, and I'm tumbling tumbling, my body was getting torn apart. I thought, yeah, my head's going to be next, or my neck, and it'll all be over. Falling 2,000 feet and counting, Stephen realized his only hope was to try to stop himself and let the wet slab of debris continue past him. I dig my hands in the snow, and I dig my feet in the snow, and classic self-arrest position, and I, I look down and my lower leg is just flopping off to the side because I had torn all the ligaments in my right leg. And I look down and just go, oh man, that's not right. Alone in a remote part of the park with a fractured back and two blown knees, with no food, water, or warm clothing, all he could do was hope and wait. I was really reaching out mentally to, to people I knew and, and sending energy and vibrations and, and will that I was injured and I needed help. When search and rescue rangers finally found Stephen 24 hours later, he was beaten up and hypothermic, but lucky to be alive. Today, Stephen lectures on learning about avalanches before hitting the backcountry. 
lot of, a lot of snow. The American Avalanche Institute teaches the basics of avalanche right. safety in and around Grand Teton National Park. I can't see this where it rolls. So it seems like it gets just over 35 degrees, which is getting into the perfect slope angle which the most avalanches run. The class learns how to recognize risky conditions. Jump again. Most victims trigger the avalanches themselves. So students test their body weight on the snowpack to see if it will slide. <laughs> We're not trying to tell people to just stay home or to never ski anything steeper than 25 degrees, but they need to understand that if they're pushing into bigger, steeper terrain, have they made that decision based on facts, based on a good stability assessment, or are they just, you know, playing Russian roulette, rolling the dice? The ski patrol at Jackson Hole is ready for a rescue. With frequent drills, patrollers create an avalanche scenario and go to work probing and listening for signals from buried transceivers. But their best rescue tool may be their best friend, too. We got that. Good girl. Hey, Reed, we got a find. Jackson Hole employs a team of specially trained canines. With a nose thought to be 44 times stronger than a person's, the dogs can detect human scent percolating up from deep in the snow. Handlers work constantly to hone their skills. One patroller runs his lab named Hooter in a zigzag pattern downhill, so she covers as much terrain as possible. It doesn't take long for her to catch a whiff. She she gets really excited. She just she just knows what she's gonna do. She's gonna dig up something and get excited and get some praise and bounce around and start to bark and just uh, her motor's always running. Within just a few minutes, she's located a mock victim. Get him out of there! Good girl, get him out of there! Better girl! Come on! Who's that, Hood? Is that Ryan? Good job! Good, 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 good. <laughs> Even though patrollers and their dogs are on standby for a rescue. All right, huh? The best way to survive an avalanche is to avoid it. Along the Teton Range, things only seem serene. Grand Teton and neighboring Yellowstone National Park make up an area called the Greater Yellowstone Teton Region where there's a powerful geological connection. Earthquakes make and shake these mountains born out of a violent past some eight to 10 million years ago. The Teton Range right here, of course, is about 50 miles long. At the base of the range, there is a fault, namely an escarpment in the ground that actually marks the surface location of where the ground ruptures all the way from the fault clear to the east side of this valley. So we're standing over the Teton Fault right here, but it's about 10 miles down. The fault has a history of rupturing approximately every thousand years, with a major quake that causes the mountains to rise up as the valley drops down. There hasn't been a major rupture in 2,800 years, so it could happen again any time. Throughout the park, high-tech satellite tracking instruments called GPS track shifts in the Earth every 15 seconds. So we attach this antenna to bedrock that allows us to determine how this position moves because the GPS system measures location, that is latitude, longitude, and elevation. Surveillance data 
is transmitted to the University of Utah, where scientists keep a close watch on the Teton earthquakes and the Yellowstone volcano. The lateral motion of the caldera is pushing its neighbor. Its next door neighbor is the Teton Fault. Likewise, pressure that might be loading the fault puts pressure on the caldera. And so it's a question of chicken and the egg. We're not sure which one is the dominant feature. We think they interact about equally. Scientists not only study the system, they supply safety information to both national parks. It's not just what's under the earth that connects the parks. But the creatures that walk upon it. The parks and surrounding wilderness lands make up part of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, one of the largest protected regions on earth. We are a a small part of this much larger landmass, and together that provides enough space for lots of different animals to live out their annual um, rituals. And because of that, we have now all the native species that once occurred here are, are here, like bears, wolves, other predators, they're free to interact. It's a really fantastic situation that doesn't exist in many places. Along with the geology and the wildlife, Yellowstone and Grand Teton share some four million annual visitors who come to revel in the scenery and recharge. It's just like nowhere else. Just everything is huge and there's wildlife everywhere and it just seems so pure and natural. I'm still running on adrenaline from what we have seen and experienced, you know, there from wildlife to just the views and just being out here, period. Over 80 years ago, park founders had the foresight to preserve a place of beauty. A place that became part of one of the largest protected regions on Earth and an unrivaled playground where you can raft a raging river, climb sky high, cavort with cowboys, and unwind in style. This recreation mecca and sanctuary for all transforms from season to season, but always wakes the spirit on a grand scale.